All right, the next item coming forward is related to our return to school and the new school year. You know, we um, are thrilled to be two weeks underway in the new school year. And so while at our last board meeting, we took, to, took a deep dive into readiness for school opening, this will give us um, a brief overview. So I am thrilled to report that the new school year is well underway. We've had a really smooth start. Um, you'll see photos and smiling faces. Um, on the screen that are just a glimpse of the excitement we experienced at our schools across the county on the first day of the new school year. Uh, the positive energy was absolutely contagious and I think it really reflects a feeling of a welcome routine, uh, return to some favorite school day routines. And as is customary, our talented TV services team has captured video highlights from across Henrico County Public Schools to provide us an up close glimpse at the first week of school. So that that video is coming forward for your pleasure. Thank you. you excited? Yay! <laughs> you have a good day. Come on, Mom says you need breakfast. Come on. Come on. Good morning. You have a fantastic day, beautiful girl. Good morning. Hey, young man. Good morning, everybody. Let's go. Come on in. Good morning, Penguins! Happy first day of school! We're excited to see you! Good mo mo morning! Good mo mo morning! Are y'all ready for the first day of school? Yeah! Good morning! Good, how are you guys? Good morning, boys and girls! Say hey! My first day! I'd like to say hi to you! <laughs> So you're in room 807. Do you know where that is? Yeah. Good morning. Happy We're birthday. so happy! <laughs> Good morning! Good morning! One, two, three! How y'all doing this morning? Welcome back. Good morning, guys! Good morning. Good morning. Hey man, it's another day, it's another opportunity, and I'm excited to get started with these youngins. I just wanted to welcome everybody back to the 2022-2023 school year. I hope you all are excited about the first day of school. And we look forward to great things coming. Let's go, let's make it a first day, a great first day. Hey y'all, hope y'all have a great school year. Have a great first day. What was the L? Does anyone remember Journey? Labels. labels. And labels go on the axis. Make an axis with your hands, right? The labels, that's what we're graphing. So each part of her name belonged to a family member of hers. So Sophia belonged to her grandmother. Mason, what did you learn about your friend? Uh, she likes science and reading. Uh, seven plus seven is? 14. 14. Like Six. Right, and eight times two. Hey guys, we're going to a badgery. We're going to a badgery. Four, three, two, one, fantastic. Does anybody know the answer to that last question that I asked? I'm gonna give you about 10 minutes to do that. Everybody okay? Everybody say woo. woo. Excellent work. I like the way you went back and double checked yourself. Very good work. Good thinking. That's a great idea. Kiss your brain. I love it. <laughs> oh, it was great. We will have to see it again another time. But uh, thank you again to our communications team for putting that wonderful video together. And thanks to many of our board members, central team members, and lots of volunteers who were on hand last week to assist in welcoming our students to a new school year. Um, so as we segue to some operational pieces, I first wanna provide um, a brief staffing update. You'll recall at our last meeting, uh, just on the cusp of the first day, we reported that we had 170 76 openings division-wide with a 95.2% uh, staffing rate. This week, we're happy to report we continue to make progress on our staffing levels um, at 172 openings today, down from 176 at our last report, and continue to leverage um, board substitutes and other uh, certified staff who typically serve in different roles outside of the classroom to provide coverage. Um, and of course, we continue to recruit teachers, instructional aides, and other staff persons 
positions. Um, also, a reminder for context that we did add 80 new instructional positions this year, uh, which we believe are of critical uh, support to our schools. But we're, that means we're actually recruiting more instructional roles uh, for this year than last. Um, and we have also ensured that every classroom has been covered since day one as we continue to find the most qualified candidates for each open position. Mr. Pritchard and Dr. Hughes will now provide a few brief updates. Again, as a reminder, today's presentation builds on the comprehensive back to school readiness presentation that we provided at the August 25th work session. So today's updates are abbreviated and re are related primarily to highlighting operations of our schools during just these first two weeks um, since we've been open. Mr. Pritchard. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Cashwell. Um, in addition to staffing updates, we want to now provide a brief update to our, our operations as the school year is underway. We'll quickly cover facilities, transportation, school nutrition, and health and wellness. As I noted in our back to school readiness updates last month, our, over the summer, our facilities, custodians, and school-based teams did a lot to get our school's buildings ready for the new year. Staff completed projects in all 72 buildings, including HVAC, roofing, flooring, maintenance, and deep cleaning of classrooms and common spaces. While the opening week of school was a great success on many fronts, we did have a few issues with HVAC systems at several of our schools. Some of our extended planned project work and others were due to unforeseen glitches, breakdowns in systems. The operations team worked quickly to address each issue and in case we're in, in fix is still in progress. Um, staff monitors the progress of these projects regularly and make alternate plans for sites when there are supply, ch uh, supply chain issues, vendor manpower availability issues, and or, or, and or unforeseen conditions. Supply chain and vendor supply, uh, support issues continue to strain many of our project's timelines. Our school transportation team has done a phenomenal job getting all 1,658 routes up and running. During the first two weeks, ridership trends uh, tend to level out and routes do become more finalized. And at that time, I will be able to better uh, report on the status of the late buses. The bus app has gone well, and we have heard positive feedback from our HCPS community. The challenges that we have experienced is bandwidth issues that is on the end of Edgelog and not HCPS. This has created some connectivity, some connectivity issues for parents. This is why we continue to use the school messenger to keep parents informed. The other area that we're improving is uh, when a bus is out of service and the bus substitutions are made, this can affect the accuracy of the Edgelog uh, bus parent portals. As a reminder, the Edgelog parent portal to the ACPS bus app is now available for parents and students. The website is, is listed above or is listed on our website and above on this, this presentation where families can find out more information. Um, I do have some really positive news to share that I feel like it's great. Um, we have 14 drivers and two bus assistants that should go out into their zones in the next two to three weeks. Yes. Hey. Um, so this will help with some of our, it help filling in some of our routes and eliminating double um, runs in areas. And so then I will now move on to school nutrition and provide that update. As pandemic funding and school nutrition programs come to an end, we have delivered post-pandemic food service plans for all of our schools. While meal applications are once again required to qualify for free and reduced price meals, many ACPS students will not be required to complete applications due to direct uh, certification and the community eligibility provision CEP. School Nutritional Services continues to expand its participation in the C CEP program with 40 schools, currently offering free meals to all students. A list of current CEP schools can be found on our website. And at this time, I will now turn the presentation over to Dr. Hughes, the Chief Learning Officer. Thank you. All right, so for an update on health and wellness, school nurses and staff are working to ensure all students are attending school healthy and ready to learn. In recent years, student immunization requirements have changed. Therefore, one priority with the start of the year is to ensure and help families and students um, access immunization clinics as needed. HCPS is working in partnership with local health departments and healthcare providers to ensure immunizations are readily available and accessible to families as quickly as possible.
This slide includes a link to the Virginia School Immunization Requirements, and families looking for op opportunities for immunization clinics should contact their school nurse who can connect them with opportunities in the community. HCPS is also communicating opportunities to families via HCPS newsletter. The school nursing teams are also working to remind staff, parents, and students that they should not come to school if they are ill. With regard to COVID-19, individuals who test positive do need to isolate at home for day zero through five and can return on day six if fever free for 24 hours and medication free. Students and staff no longer need to quarantine after exposures. More information about COVID guidance is on the website and COVID test kits remain available for any student or staff who requests them. This concludes our brief update. And at this time, Dr. Pritchard and I will be happy to answer any questions. Thank you oh. so. <laughs> Dr. Pritchard says no. I was gonna say, <laughs> you just graduated, Lenny. I can't get one. You'll take it, you'll take it. Uh, thank you, Mr. Pritchard and Dr. Hughes. Uh, I'll start on this end this time with Ms. Atkins. So thank both of you for the presentation. I only had one comment. Um, around air conditioning, I know that many bodies in one space generate more heat. And I have uh, received uh, feedback that there are a few schools um, where the air conditioning is not working. I want to share with you that Lenny and I have had conversations. They are working diligently to resolve those issues and we're hopeful that we'll have them resolved very, very soon. The question that I have mm. is, I recognize that there are some maintenance issues that are not predictable. However, I do have a question with our newer schools that may be experiencing air conditioning issues. If you could address why they may be happening and or um, just some insight into our protocols and trying to make sure that we do the very best we can to ensure that uh, we're up to date on all of our equipment. I mean, I, I, it's a little bit more challenging to answer from a new school perspective, but I, I will say that I think that overall, and I've reached out to my counterparts across the, the central region to get more information, but with some of the stuff that we did in prevention for to create better air quality for our students during COVID with multiple flushings of outside of air with our indoor parts and then upgrading our filters, that does put a strain on our HVAC system, or it did put a strain on our HVAC system. So I think that we are starting to see some of the consequences for that. Um, I know that in one particular <laughs> school that you're referencing to, um, we are, that is one, because we are still under, under warranty with the contractor to make sure that this thing is up and running to its full efficiency. So we are still working with that part to make sure that that is done and taken care of ASAP. I wish I could give you a better answer to that. A new one, is that's, that's tough. I understand. I think that it is important that as we go through this process, because we have a few new schools, and um, with some of the things that we've done in trying to keep our air quality safe, uh, maybe taking a little bit of a step back to better understand okay. some of that, uh, because it could be preventable possibly in the future. Not all maintenance issues are, no. but this might be something that we really want to pay attention to for future schools that are going to be built and we're going to want to have some of those protocols and some of those equipment pieces that we've not had in the past that we absolutely want now and moving into the future. So that was a two-parter. One is the recommendation to consider documenting some of these things that are happening so that for future construction, we're more aware. And then the other part of it is um, really taking a look at some of these warranties. We won't go deeper into that, but I do think we might have an opportunity to put a little bit more pressure on our expectations, especially for our newer schools. We have a high um, level of expectations for equipment that we purchase. And if it is under warranty, I think that we should be receiving a high level of customer service as well. So thank you so much for what you and your team are doing. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Atkins. Ms. Ogbear? Um, Just real quick, uh, again, a thank you. It's all related to what Ms. Atkins was talking about for reaching out to parents directly because I know you did that and I sent a couple your way and just appreciate the direct approach that you took to 
parents who had concerns about especially the HVAC issues. But those happen, and I also appreciate the fact that the folks were really quick to respond and um, get those. And, and I understand you to even put portable coolers and, right. and all kinds of things uh, to try and mitigate what was going on. And it's something that we do plan to purchase a few more of these things just in case down the road um, as we head back into the latter part of the spring season um, as we're working on some of these HVAC um, um, systems. I mean, we do have a lot of um, ESSER funding projects that we that we have going on now that we will continue to have going on that's taken a little bit longer than we had anticipated. Well, um, everything is yes. these days, so, it seems like. But yeah. just to be prepared, we we plan to go out. I mean, you know, catch these things on sale as the season goes out, <laughs> get more of them. So, um, but we do plan on looking at those things, and we have been. And I think that we are currently in line to purchase at least a few more of these, like right now, so we can have these in place moving forward. Appreciate it. Thank yes. you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Ms. Ogburn. Ms. Kinsella? Yes, I just share everyone else's enthusiasm for you addressing um, our, H, our HVAC issues because I too had quite a few schools. Not only the division have um, some issues, but I had quite a few in my district. So just thank you for your responsiveness as we've um, shared those with you. Um, I just wanna thank every single team member um, in this room and around the division uh, because the enthusiasm, honestly, for getting back on track and in our buildings has been amazing. Whether it's students that are so excited, it's staff that's so excited, parents are excited, um, community is excited. I mean, just everyone is so excited, and I just think that's been fantastic. Um, I just have a few questions and comments um, as we try to resolve some of the uh, disruptions that we may be having to instruction. Um, staffing. Um, I know uh, Reverend Cooper may have some other staffing questions. Mine's, thank you, Ms. Bolden, I see you coming to the podium. Um, mine are basically gonna, uh, my question is what are we doing that's outside of the box? Um, I think at this point we can't continue to do what we've done in the past and I know because we have these conversations a lot that we aren't doing things the same way as we always have. Um, but if you could just expand perhaps on, um, I know Mrs. Shea is going to address job sharing, but um, maybe our prep program, are we considering expanding it? Are we reaching out to our retirees? Um, are we increased, have we increased substitute pay for our experienced teachers that may come in to substitute? Just some things like that. C could you address Certainly. those? I'll share maybe two um, initiatives that we're working on. I, I know um, one Mrs. Shea has spoken about often and that's the job sharing piece. So we're in the process of exploring that. Um, we don't just automatically implement that. There are some nuances, so we want to get feedback from principals and other stakeholders because while it might sound very easy to implement, again, there are nuances. Um, we are also working with our communications department, something that we have not done in the past. Um, we always work with them, um, but around uh, getting the word out in a more effective manner with regard to retirees and the benefits of returning to teach with us. So I'm not sure if everyone knows, but just about all of our teaching positions are critical shortage area positions and retirees can return and teach with us, receive their full pay here and also their full retirement benefit. So those are two examples of some different things that we're doing. Thank you so much for addressing that, especially with our retirees, because I know I've heard from, from some and um, they're not aware. Is there, are we reaching out perhaps to employees who have retired in the last three or four years? Yes, so we've sent letters, but again, we're doing an advertising campaign and our communications department, as you know, is so adept in that area. So they're gonna help us get the word out in that respect. Okay, thank you. That's Very all I welcome. have. The, the next ones are for you, Mr. Pritchard. Can you um, let me know how has laptop distribution gone? Have all of our students received laptops? Do you know? 
I know that's. I know that it's on my agenda to have uh, that discussion with uh, Mr. Maddox, and, okay. and we'll have that discussion, and I could get that to you in a board update. I know that schools have been working on it. Um, we, we have seen an increase of students that participate in summer programming and summer school. So we have to take those devices back, get those refreshed and get those back out as well. That's why we do collect them up at the beginning, at the end of the year and do all of that stuff. And those things are a lot easier to, 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 to manage. But each school, you know, each secondary school has a TST. Okay. So, you know, how the, what plan the school is working with to roll those things out. But I know that that is in process and I would probably be safe to say that the majority of our students, yes, they do have a laptop. Okay, thank you very yes. much. Um, my next question is having spent some time in transportation this week, um, I just want to, uh, say I, I love hearing that we've hired uh, 14 you said 14 new drivers and two assistants well if all goes well you know i'm, I'm swe i sweated out to the last minute but two to three weeks they're almost there we can put those and infuse those back into some of our, our zones so how many drivers would you say that were short i know each school year from following schools for a long time each school year we've been traditionally short if you will but how many do you think um, we're short, really? I'll give I mean, you two answers. We're 70 bus drivers short on paper, but to get ourselves back to that pre-pandemic state, we're about 30 drivers short. About 30 drivers yes, short. Thank you so much for clarification on that. And you can that. subtract 14. <laughs> yes, yes. So I can subtract 14. Which is 16. Okay. <laughs> thank, thank you so much. And then um, I just had some feedback or just actually first I want to make a comment and I want to highlight something that you said in your, your presentation. You know, the first, the first few weeks are always busy as we have students continuing to enroll and then we have students who aren't necessarily riding the bus and we have stops where there are zero students standing. So as over the next few weeks, we should see some efficiencies. Yes. Correct. Absolutely. Yes, we will. I'd also note, um, you know, our high schools are the last in the tier. And so some of the most complex transportation issues are at our elementary schools in those opening weeks, getting kids on and off the bus. And so that can often cause some extended delays those first weeks that begin that unfortunately I know can impact the secondary schools the most. And so we're beginning to see those routines and processes at the elementary school speed up a little bit, which will help folks get on the road and to their secondary pickups quicker. So secondary includes middle and high school. I appreciate that clarity because I've heard quite a bit um, from middle and high school parents um, that are concerned that some of the transportation arrival times specifically um, impacting instruction are repeating themselves from last year. And I just want to hear us say that's that's not going to be the case going forward correct yes i mean we have taken procedures and 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 put them in place of going out and picking up students earlier it's just getting through these hurdles i mean you, you remember at a middle school dr cashwell talked about an elementary school well in a middle school you're talking about a third of your students this is a new environment to them it's a new thing it's a new concept for your high schools that's a fourth of your students that are going through this at a different level in a different place for the first time so we're working through this at all levels levels but yes it, it, I know that we worked through this and then you know we had only two areas that we felt that were going to be a conflict moving forward but knowing that this could be worked out so through we this should, process so we should not see going forward once nothing, not, nothing we like shouldn't see scheduled year. on time arrivals no. after instruction the instructional day has started at the secondary level no. except for events that happen on a daily basis that are beyond our control, correct? Yes. Okay, thank you for highlighting that. And then other than that, I have a question about the bus app. And you're right, you stated in the presentation, overall feedback has uh, been favorable. But will the school administrator, how do school administrators use the app? Is there gonna be a piece designed for school administration to have access? I mean, we can look into that. Do. We can look into that and see if that's something okay. that would be beneficial to them. I mean, I mean I'm sure if, as they're planning for their the beginning of their day, that's something they can chart with their buses as well. Okay. The person is in charge, but it's something we can look into. The main thing rolling out was making sure that it went out and that the parents that were using it, that we were in a good place with that as well. I, I would appreciate yes. that. And then um, I guess in, I just want to share that I heard quite a bit from our specialty center 
parents about hub buses in general, and then also about some of our CTE transportation. For example, you know, getting the students from their CTE programs back to their zone building in time to catch that afternoon bus. And will those, um, Will those routes get more efficient as well? Yes. Okay. I mean, you know, and our hub system is probably our most challenging system that we have. I mean, it, it requires a lot of work and effort and massaging to go through that, but I feel confident that we can work through all of those problems as well. It is, a, it's a lot of moving parts at yes. the hubs. You are it's, right. It is a ton of pieces. Okay. That's all I had. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Kinsella, Reverend Cooper. Thank you, Madam Chair. So I want to just quickly start with staffing. So I know that. Um, our recruitment retention numbers are fluid. Um, we just approved personal items, um, which included many new hires and some separations. Um, we've, we've been all hands on deck. I had the privilege first day of school of um, joining Dr. Cashwell as she taught in one of my schools in the Fairfield District, and she did a phenomenal job. I'm wondering if she's a better teacher than a superintendent, but I don't know. I can't make the analysis, but <laughs> she did a phenomenal job. Um, and, 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 and her being in that, that classroom was, was a great example of temporary assignments that we have made to try to accommodate issues that have occurred, um, creatively coming up with solutions, implementing those to ensure coverage and learning is happening in all of our classrooms since day one that school is open. But I quickly want to drill down on the current number of our full-time teacher vacancies that exist across the county, but specifically in Fairfield and Verona, but Fairfield for this particular question, where most of the um, vacancies are concentrated. So the last data I looked at was from the 26th. And so we know, I think Dr. Cash was alluded to, we're going to get updated data probably this week. And so I, I am cognizant and conscious of the fluidity of that, that data. But based upon that, that data document, I, I broke down the vacancies in our elementary schools. And so we talk about reading, we talk about literacy, and, and Dr. Hinton just informed us when we're gonna see um, those numbers. And I've mentioned it before, and we all know that research shows that there's a direct correlation um, between literacy, uh, skills, dropout rates, and incarceration rates. And at the elementary levels where we've been talking about early identification for gifted programs, preparing our students for specialist centers, IB, AP course enrollment. We talk about equity access opportunity, but in um, the Verona, the Fairfield district, the vacancies, um, for one example, I have one school that has 10 vacancies, whereas that one school has more vacancies than three magisterial districts combined. And so for me personally, when you talk about 49 FTEs, and that's, no, that's what it's noted, 49, 35%, 47%, Fairfield, Verona. And so the question I raise is how do we balance the number of qualified full-time teachers versus temporary reassignment substitutes or board subs at certain schools because, you know, I want to make sure that, that, that the kids in my school who do not have, per our documents, a FTE full-time teacher at such a high rate, you know, compared to other magistrate districts that they have, one district has no vacancies literally no vacancies for full-time teachers. The others have five. I think it was one had five, one had four. Um, so I just want to talk about that briefly because I've been getting a lot of questions pertaining to that. And I think that the whole um, picture is not really being shared because the, the numbers in and themselves don't speak to what we're actually doing to ensure that those deficiencies are being dealt with. So can you just kind of briefly give me an update on that? Sure. So I want to make sure I'm answering the correct question. Um, so there's a piece of that that maybe speaks to recruitment and retention. And then there may be a piece, and this is the part I want you to clarify. Are you asking about resources that we're providing to ensure that the students are well served? Sure, right. So you talk about the recruitment and retention. I'm sure that hopefully the document we get tomorrow before the week's out, we'll update these numbers. But I just yes. want to acknowledge publicly the, the comments and the questions I've been getting based upon the last document dated August 26th, where there were, you know, 10 vacancies at a Glen Leaf, for example. Sure. And so, for example, at Glen Lee, with Before you answer, and I just want to say that the, the four schools I'm looking at specifically are Ratcliffe, Laburnum, Glen Lee, Ash, and I am very aware that all four of those are Title I schools. Yes, yes. 
So I can speak to the recruitment and retention piece, and perhaps Dr. Grant can speak to the, the supports and resources piece. Um, so, for example, at Glen Lee, all of those positions are filled with a board sub. And so for several of those board subs, we're actively working to help them become fully licensed teachers. And so in addition to that, we are pursuing grants. For example, one grant that we're pursuing, it's called the RIPE grant. I can only remember the first two words of the grant, but it's a recruitment incentive grant from the state. And it's targeted to individuals hired in August and November between that time frame. And identified individuals will receive an extra $5,000 for accepting a, a teaching position. Should we receive the grant? Should we receive the grant? <laughs> so we are pursuing that. So that's one example of a uh, recruitment strategy. Um, something we do have in place, though, is we have partnerships with the University of Richmond and Virginia State University, wherein our provisionally licensed teachers uh, are able to take courses towards full licensure at a reduced or a um, or for free, so that's one incentive to help defray the cost of individuals obtaining a licensure. Uh, within the division, we've assessed the instructional assistants we have and identified those who are poised to become licensed or can get into that pipeline, and to help them pay for their coursework. Instead of reimbursing their tuition on the back end, we are upfronting that, again, to defray cost. So those are some of the recruitment slash retention initiatives, and we can provide you a more exhaustive list. No, I appreciate that because, I, I, again, I think that too often when you deduce um, the situation to specific, just the numbers, and not look at it from the aggregate, as far as what else is actually taking place, it kind of skews the reality of the situation because if you look at that data, it says we have 10 FTE full-time teachers uh, in needed in Glen Lee, but what you just stated was each of those classrooms have board certified substitute teachers who are in essence on the precipice of yes. becoming um, full-fledged full teachers qualified for that class. And then you add to that the IAs that are poised to make that next step in what we're doing to incentivize um, persons to take these jobs. So that 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 thank you for giving that. That's yes, very thank helpful. Thank you. Thank you for the question. And so, how, how long do we know before the uh, grant is uh, approved, either you or Dr. Cashman? I'm not sure the timeline. I hope it's imminent. Okay, thanks. <laughs> well, well, Dr. Grant, can you kind of speak to look? Because, for example, Glenley has a brand new principal, right? So, what are we doing? And, and use that as kind of a microcosm of what may be the paradigm for others. The other three I have are the ones that Ms. Ash, uh, Atkins may have, or Brooklyn, or even Tuckahoe. In addition to our recruitment and retention strategies, in our Title I, a lot of our Title I schools, um, we have additional support resources, human resources and material resources. So you see vacancies because of that, all the supports we've added into schools like interventionists, um, math coaches, reading coaches, deans of students of that nature. Yeah, and I think to Dr. Grant's point, you know, one of the, and certainly, and I think Mrs. Bolden described it well, and you re, you know reiterated it that you know, we don't have classrooms empty of caring adults who are trained to work with our students. We want every student to have a strong start in the classroom, but we still feel the urgency around the the recruiting and retaining staff full time. To um, and we know there are schools where there are more challenges, and, and as Dr. Grant pointed out, a number of those are in our Title One schools. And I think it's important to note that, as she pointed out, there are more staff assigned to those schools and additional support staff, the people to teacher ratio is lower because of the federal program we belong to to receive those Title I dollars because students are at risk. So that means the principal there is recruiting for more staff than the principal at another elementary school, for example. So I, mean, I think, again, numbers don't tell the full story. It's looking at that full picture. Um, but then at the same time, there are often support staff, interventionists, coaches who can uh, temporarily be reassigned to fill in in the classroom who are qualified. And still, there's a vacancy to fill. and We want all of those robust resources um, filled so that we're meeting 
meeting the needs of the students, but as Dr. Grant said, really making sure that the schools that have the needs have the resources, uh, both the human resources and the material resources to make a difference. No, thank you, Dr. Cashman. You, thank and, you. Yes, and we're providing support to the principal to make sure we set him up for fit, um, success. I, I see Dr. Uh, he just wants to say <laughs> You know, <something>. instruction. <laughs> no, um, in addition, though, the Division of Learning, um, we made sure that the board substitutes that were hired were able to participate in the new teacher academy this year. And in addition, we've created a dashboard that certainly all of our teachers can access, but really geared towards our board, board subs who really might need, you know, some quick understanding in uh, the teaching and learning framework, the instructional model, literacy. So um, we've tried to really break things down and give them access to tools that they can access readily and so they won't have to go digging. In addition, we have a, a list of all of the board subs and every specialist in central office, particularly in the Division of Learning, has those lists and they're instructed when they go out in schools to make sure that they're touching base, what support might you need, touch base with the principals. We work so closely with Ingrid's team. What else can we do to help them? Because we want them to be successful. Well, it's obvious it's a team effort from Ms. Bolden to yourself, to Dr. Grant, to Dr. Castro, that, that all of us, as I stated in my first statement, it is all hands on deck. Mm -hmm. And again, if you just deduce the, the context to just a number, but not understanding on the, on the micro everything else that goes into that number and our efforts to mitigate that number. Right. And therefore, hopefully our constituents, our families understand right. the, the magnitude of our effort to, to, to mitigate this. So thank you all so much. I really appreciate that. Um, Ms. Pritchett, quick question. I know no one really drilled down um, on the specifics of their schools because we have so many of us, we have so many of our schools, especially over 72 facilities. Um, but quick question, um, can you just quickly, on Longdale, I know we've had some challenges with the HVAC, H AC unit, um, control issues, main office, back classrooms, and the control issues for the back classrooms have all been repaired. Um, there were some supply chain issues related to the placement of the coil that caused a four-month delay. Um, but we were expecting to receive it this week. Do you know that we've received it or, or how we, where are we at with that as far as that reception and the work completion? Yes, to my knowledge, I believe that that part was done and that system was fixed. And we just would note, we'll provide the board yes. a full update, a status report on any of the projects that are in progress as of the last status update, because I know, you know, there are a lot of specific <laughs> questions you may get from a number of your schools and we want you to have the up-to-date info. All right, so can I just get these to you, the ones that I have specific questions, because I don't want to, now my peers are looking at me crazy, right? So Glenn Lee, like the new cooling tower, Fairfield, you know, the the um, operating system parts, wow, the new heat pump. I'm just, I mean, I've got a list, I went to the whole thing. Yes. We, we will you get, get you that, specifics, yes. yes. And we'll provide the, the full board an update on schools yeah. across the board, because I know a number of you, you may continue, and I mean, absolutely to receive constituent questions, to have questions. We want to make sure you're prepared to answer them. Look forward to giving you this. Yeah, message. but good news for Longdale. So. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Bridget. Yes, Madam, Super well. Madam Chair. Can I just say, Madam Chair, can I just add something? If sure. you don't mind. Um, just, Mr. Pritchard, could you just say how many items you've actually addressed? Because yes, our schools have had issues more than we would have thought. But I mean, the team has actually addressed many of them. Since, since la the latter part of last spring, over 200 and some calls that we've, that we've gone through over, and, and people also need to understand, we, we have over 500 systems within our 72 schools. And some of them are, I could stand beside them and I would look small. So there you go. Well, thank you. Large, I mean, when we start talking 300 parts being craned up on top of a building, I mean, it's, it's some of it's pretty extensive work that has to get done. Thank you so much. Yes, thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Thank you so, th thank you so much. Um, I have to say, I've heard um, mostly all, with all but two um, issues, I've heard um, just such positive feedback across the board from all of our, all of my schools, all of my staff, um, parents. Um, of just how smooth the opening to school this year has gone on all fronts, except for. Um, two little sub bullets. So let's talk a little about those. And my apologies to the team. I had a lot of thoughts come up as you were presenting. So these are not meant as stumpers, uh, but if you need, so if you need to get back with me, uh, feel free. Um, the, the most, um, the most concern that I've heard around um, from my parents is 
um, class size for third through fifth grade. Lenny, you're off the hook for this one. Um, is class size for third to fifth grade. So I don't know if this is um, Dr. Cashwell or, um, but can you talk a little bit why we're seeing larger class sizes for third to fifth grade? Um, what supports we have to help um, alleviate the struggles there. I can certainly address that. Um, and, and we'll also, as we're finalizing enrollment, make sure we provide up-to-date numbers for the board on how uh, class sizes are actually parsing out. So um, as schools are accepting enrollment and creating classes uh, throughout the summer and planning for the school year, uh, you know, we always examine those pupil to teacher ratios and to the discussion uh, we've had and, you know, all of your colleagues have expressed concern over making sure that we have a qualified staff member in every building. In the past, we've had enough staff to kind of spread out, and in some cases where enrollment might have been lower, we might have kept a staff member in that place. In this case, we've had to collapse sections and consolidate, and so in some cases, um, class sizes at the secondary, uh, elementary, third, fourth, and fifth may be higher than typical, but are still well below the SOQ, and um, you know, in, in cases where they may be a little higher, we've also worked to make sure there's an instructional assistant added to those schools to be able to assist teachers um, as needed. I know this board has made it a priority um, since the start to continue to look at class size, the impact of that on the instructional model, um, and that is something we have not shifted away from, and nor has our stance on that changed, uh, but the reality of the staffing issues and making sure we're using the staff we have on hand appropriately to staff our schools, uh, that did mean shifting some classes that in the past might have been overlooked because we were padded with enough staff elsewhere. Thank you. I know um, that's a concern at um, a handful of my schools, and so I appreciate you speaking to it a little bit, as well as um, reporting once we get enrollment um, verified, reporting back to us on on what what it really looks like. And that you know that balancing continues, you know, into the school year. And while no one wants to see classes collapsed or consolidated, we we are watching enrollment as we always do, and in, in trying to get a um, better idea of what students actually are showing up and or who's been a no show and so on to make sure we're maximizing staff. Thank you. And then um, the other um, concern I've heard, Lenny, you are on the hook for this one, um, is um, uh, for, well, before I get into that, I want to uh, commend your team for, uh, your HVAC team for tirelessly and continuously over the last couple of weeks um, servicing schools. And like you said, we have over 500 different systems in our schools. Um, but one that's a particular concern, and you and I have talked about it, and Dr. Cashwell and I have talked about it, um, is Freeman High School, and particularly the structure of how it's uh, different units kind of daisy chained together. Um, it has some um, some additional challenges, let's say. And so um, I've made multiple trips over there to kind of walk the building and feel the air. It was nice and chilly everywhere yesterday. So I appreciate your, your team helping with that fix. But long term, um, I just want to be on the record for people to know that this is a conversation we're having about long term, how we look at um, ameliorating those kind of continual concerns. Yes. And, and I know that we've had conversations, we have had conversations before, and it's something that we will work with uh, Mr. Wack and see if we can identify funding to, to eventually put this thing and get this project on the board and get it done. So. I, re I, re I, I really appreciate yes. that um, because it's a lot of days, you know, you get one part up and the other part goes down and it's, it's a bit of a domino effect. Um, thank you. Thank you for that. Uh, just uh, two other questions. Uh, quick, well, two quick questions. Um, Ms. Bolden, I just, um, actually, I was unaware of the retirement issue um, where they could um, have their full retirement benefits as well as get full pay. Does that apply if we can recruit from retirees from other divisions? Yes, any BRS retiree. That's what I like to hear. Um, and then I also just want to thank your team for looking into the job share that you and I have been talking about since I think like the third day I took office. Uh, I know that there are a lot of hurdles um, and that that is a, a significant lift building that infrastructure. Um, my hope is that uh, just as uh, distance learning was a catalyst for us to be able to get an HVA um, structure up and running that perhaps uh, a silver lining of some 
some of these staffing challenges is it will be able to be a catalyst um, to look into this opportunity. So I recognize it comes with a lot of hurdles, but I really appreciate us looking into it and hopefully for being kind of a regional leader in um, this opportunity um, to think outside the box um, and um, provide um, different kind of employment opportunities to get um, our skilled, qualified educators in the classroom. So thank you for that. And then my last question, um, just this might be something that um, the team needs to get back with me on. So, so thinking about um, nutrition and as we have, um, we need families to fill out the free and reduced uh, lunch forms this year. Um, but spending time um, in my schools these past two weeks, I've been with a lot of um, elementary classrooms where they have snack time and students don't have snack. And so the teacher or the school is providing um, snacks for students who don't, and they're working on identifying if it's a student who just forgot snack or if this is a student who um, qualifies for free and reduced lunch and creating an infrastructure um, to provide that snack on a regular basis. So um, just looking at from a um, division standpoint, we don't want that financial lift on our teachers to have to be going every week to buy additional um, snacks. Uh, for, uh, to provide their students. So looking at um, from structure, um, how do we um, support that so that our, all of our students have the opportunity to have um, snacks in the classroom and it's not coming out of personal funds um, for the teacher. Yes, thank you for that feedback. I think that's something that we can look into, all of us together, and see what we can come up with a solution for. We certainly don't want the teachers to go into their pockets for this. That's right. And a lot of the classrooms um, I was in, they shared that they have like community partners that had provided a bunch of snacks at the beginning of the year. Um, so they weren't necessarily diving into their own pockets at this point in the year. But when we look at sustainability going forth throughout the year, I want to make sure um, that they always have what they need to support their students, but especially when it comes to food sure. security. Right. Absolutely. Thank you for that feedback. Thank we'll you. Um, and that's all for anything else, colleagues. All right. Um, thank you so much, team, for that update. Thank you again to our presenters. And I hope anyone listening heard two golden nuggets from that presentation. VRS retirees <laughs> can come back and work full time because all teaching positions are critical shortage areas. And you can receive your full time pay as well as your full time VRS uh, benefit. And if you do not have a teaching license but are credentialed otherwise and want to work towards one, HCPS can uh, help you obtain your license with little to no cost. So that's masters and uh, oftentimes bachelor coursework that we would help pay for. So uh, great things underway in the recruitment and retention area. And uh, hopefully by repeating that a number of times, we'll get it out in the atmosphere. <laughs> so 